turning down the Beatles for the tremolos? Passing on Umbrella? If you think you've had a bad day at work, you ain't seen nothing yet. The Beatles are so universally lauded today that it is almost impossible to believe that there was a time in which they struggled to get a record deal. But it really happened. In fact, one of the biggest record labels of the day turned down the band that would become the biggest in pop music history. On New Year's Day 1962, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Pete Best entered the recording studio of the mighty Decca Records. Under the guidance of their ambitious manager, Brian Epstein, they cut 15 tracks in an hour, one take for each, believing them to broadly demonstrate their talents. Though they had built a sizable fan base on the live circuit in both the UK and Germany, this was their biggest shot at the big time to date. Shockingly, executives at Decca Records rejected the Fab Four in favor of another group, Brian Poole and the Tremolos. As incomprehensible as their decision might seem today, the Beatles' own long-serving producer, George Martin, later claimed that he might also have rejected the group on the basis of their iffy performance at Decca. That said, these very recordings were what piqued Martin's interest when Epstein brought the Beatles to his attention at EMI. The rest, of course, is history. By the mid-1990s, there were few bands on the planet quite as big as R.E.M., with anthemic singles such as Losing My Religion and multi-platinum selling albums including Out of Time and Automatic for the People, the band had found a great deal of mainstream success. It was off the back of this gold streak that in 1996, Warner Brothers offered R.E.M. an incredible $80 million multi-album deal. However, the label's timing proved to be highly unfortunate and R.E.M.'s record-breaking contract pretty much amounted to money down the drain for Warner Brothers. Though R.E.M. had been one of the biggest and most critically acclaimed artists of the early 1990s, their star began to fall almost immediately after signing their new contract. Notably, founding member Bill Berry left the band soon after, and the band's dynamic radically altered as a result. None of their albums thereafter reached the heights of their early work. The industry itself was also about to be upended by the impact of illegal internet file sharing and the growth of streaming platforms, decimating the CD market through which REM had once flourished. REM finally announced their split in 2011. Yoko Ono has long been maligned as the woman who helped break up the Beatles. Nowadays, however, many fans point to a more direct cause of the band's downfall, the appointment of unscrupulous manager Alan Klein. But it wasn't just the Beatles themselves who found themselves contending with difficult management. Their protégés, Bad Finger, fared even worse. The Welsh pop rockers, who were signed to the Beatles' Apple record label, enjoyed a string of hits in the late 60s and early 70s. And for a while, it really looked like they were going to be the next big thing. Then, in 1970, Bad Finger signed a deal with Stan Pauly, a man who claimed he would use the band's money to turn them into a music empire. But Polly was actually a fraudster, one who crippled the band's finances for his own enrichment. Tragically, Pete Ham, Badfinger's lead vocalist and songwriter, was devastated by the ruin of the band he had poured his heart and soul into. He died by suicide on April 24, 1975, and referred to Polly as a soulless bastard in his suicide note. Ham's dear friend and bandmate, bassist Tom Evans, died by suicide eight years later. When you picture Bruce Springsteen on stage, it's difficult to imagine him without the presence of Steve Van Zandt. This iconic guitarist is also famous in his own right as an actor, most notably for portraying Silvio Dante in The Sopranos. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. But Van Zandt hasn't always been a stalwart member of Springsteen's E Street Band. In fact, in 1982, the guitarist walked out on Springsteen and the band in which he had always believed he was co-leader. He believed that Springsteen was taking greater control of the group and freezing him out of the decision-making process. Little did he know that Springsteen was about to hit the big time with Born in the USA, the album that turned the boss and company into one of the most lucrative acts on the planet. Van Zandt returned to the E Street Band in the mid-90s after successfully establishing his acting career. In his autobiography, Unrequited Infatuations, the guitarist writes of his deep regret that he had not stayed with the band through the years that could have brought him absolute financial security. That said, he also shows appreciation for how things panned out for everybody involved, so it's not all bad. Music fans like to imagine that the earth-shattering success of the world's biggest pop stars comes entirely down to talent and dedication. But the fact is that in every successful career, there has been at least one moment when the artist was simply in the right place at the right time. 
That was certainly the case with Rihanna, who at the start of 2007 was still attempting to make a name for herself. Little did she know that she would soon score one of the biggest hits of the decade with Umbrella, which spent seven weeks atop the Billboard Hot 100 and made her third album, Good Girl Gone Bad, into a multi-platinum seller. But Umbrella wasn't originally written with Riri in mind at all. The song's writers originally intended the song to be sung by Britney Spears, who at the time was desperate for a comeback hit. However, Britney's team declined to record the song. Umbrella was also rejected by the next artist they approached, Mary J. Blige. Luckily for Rihanna, neither of the more established artists' teams could see the earworm potential in what turned out to be one of 2007's biggest songs. The Rolling Stones were always one of the more caustic rock bands associated with the counterculture movement of the 1960s. The Beatles had Sgt. Pepper's, the Stones had their Satanic Majesty's request, Jefferson Airplane sang that they wanted somebody to love, Stones frontman Mick Jagger intoned that he wanted to paint it black. And it might be argued that, at their fateful Altamont Speedway Free Festival gig in California in 1969, the band popped the era's peace and love bubble for good. The Stones' cynical attitude was evident in an unusual and knowingly provocative decision to allow 300 members of the Hells Angels, an outlaw biker gang known for violence and other criminal behavior, to act as security for the concert. With local sheriffs outnumbered by the gang, they were powerless to stop savage fights breaking out between the supposed security and the bad-tempered Altamont crowd. I can't do any more than just ask you to beg you just to keep it together. The tragic result was that one young man, Meredith Hunter, was stabbed to death by a Hell's Angel. Amid the chaos and countless casualties, two more people lost their lives in a hit and run, while another drowned in a ditch. More than anything, the disaster at Altamont proved that the 60s were very much over. Having produced a number of classic albums, Irish rockers U2 established themselves as one of the leading bands of the 80s and 90s. They have since remained a much-in-demand live draw. However, despite continuing to chart favorably in the 21st century, their place in the pantheon of popular music has certainly changed in recent years. Put simply, they've become a bit of a joke. But why? Some might argue that there has been a decline in the quality of the music itself, which, considering U2 have been a major act for more than four decades, is perhaps to be expected. But there was one particular incident that occurred in 2014 that has since been identified as the turning point in the band's public perception. The time U2 decided to release an album by pre-installing it on everyone's iPhones. The iPhone 6 launched to great fanfare in September of that year, but there was one small problem. 500,000 buyers suddenly found that U2's 13th album, Songs of Innocence, was sitting there in their iTunes app ready to be played, whether they wanted it or not. Though the deal between Apple and U2 to release the album in such a way was reportedly intended to be an industry-challenging gift to the fans, the move turned out to be a PR disaster. While Apple scrambled to build a platform to allow U2 skeptics to uninstall the album, U2 frontman Bono issued a forthright public apology. Some of the greatest musicians of all time have exploited alter egos as a way towards finding more creative freedom. Hank Williams had Luke the Drifter, Eminem had Slim Shady, and David Bowie had, well, about a million of them. I had to be very exaggerated in the beginning to um, defy people to put me into a category so that that would leave me room to work in. So why shouldn't Garth Brooks, much-loved country star of the mid-90s, also have one? That was the question he seemed to ask in 1999, when instead of his usual chart-topping country fair, he released a rock record under the guise of a black-haired Australian named Chris Gaines. The project deeply confused Brooks' core country audience, and although the album reached number two on the Billboard chart, it did so with the help of low unit pricing and was considered a monumental flop for Brooks. In an interview with Yahoo Entertainment, Brooks admitted, A lot of people misunderstood it, and my ribs are still sore from getting the kicked out of me for it. Nevertheless, the Chris Gaines project has slowly begun to find an audience in recent years with Brooks' music from the period having recently been covered by Childish Gambino, as well as Stevie Nicks and Don Henley. Few people would have the stomach to go head-to-head -head with a major corporation over lost earnings from an obscure contract written half a lifetime ago, but that's exactly what Peggy Lee did when she took Disney to court in 1991. The acclaimed jazz singer, songwriter, and actor had collaborated with her songwriting partner Sonny Burke to provide Disney with six songs for the 1955 animated feature Lady and the Tramp. The agreed fee had been $1,000, which amounts to over $11,000 today. 
Lee also performed several of the roles in the film, a job for which she earned $3,500, or almost $40,000 today. In the contract Lee had signed with Disney back in 1952, it was assured that she and Burke retained full rights to the phonograph recordings and transcriptions of their songs. Lady and the Tramp was a huge hit at the time and is now considered a Disney classic. Four decades on, when Disney was making a fortune from video sales of their classic movies, Lee argued that she was due a share of the profits from Lady and the Tramp. Disney, however, argued that the wording of the contract didn't include sales of video cassettes, which hadn't been invented at the time. The jury awarded 70-year-old Lee a multi-million dollar payout, including damages, proving that even giant corporations should always honor their contracts. Musicians today are dealing with the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic, soaring touring costs, and slim album sales margins due to the prevalence of online music streaming. But while the likes of Spotify and YouTube make listening to music easier and cheaper than ever, fans have their own problems when it comes to seeing their favorite artists perform live. This is most apparent in the high price of concert tickets, the result in many cases of what is known as dynamic pricing. Dynamic pricing is when the prices of tickets are altered, usually raised, using customer data to match ticket prices to demand and maximize profits. Many major artists instruct ticketing platforms to implement dynamic pricing to maximize earnings from live shows. This means some tickets can change hands for thousands of dollars. But while it has been argued that dynamic pricing allows artists to receive revenue that would otherwise be lost to ticket scalpers, it has also been blamed for helping distance everyday music fans from the artists they love. While industry experts continue to grapple with this issue, it seems as though the end of dynamic pricing is not yet in sight. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by dialing 988 or by calling 1-800-273-TALK-8255.